Hi guys, welcome to the lecture on attention and eye movements as part of uh, cognition and attention. This is a bit of an unusual lecture, obviously, because of the, the closing of the university. So I had to cancel the lecture of this morning and I decided just to record it uh, from home and uh, post, it, post it online so that you can uh, watch it. Um, so in today's lecture, we're going to talk about attention and eye movements, which is my own field of research, actually. And the lecture sort of consists in two parts, before and after the break, so to say. Um, although you can pause at any moment to get coffee, obviously. The, before the break, I will tell you a little bit about um, the, the, the different sort of the basics of eye movements, the different kinds of eye movements that we have. So, and the main types of eye movements that we're going to talk about are the gaze stabilization reflexes. I will explain what they are later. Smooth pursuit and saccadic eye movements. Saccadic eye movements being the type of very rapid eye movements that you probably think of when you, uh, when you hear the term eye movements. Um, and then afterwards, we're going to go more into the real cognition and attention aspect of the lecture. And we're going to talk about the relationship between attention and eye movements. Um, and talk about covert versus overt attention. Right? So a lot of people will use uh, attention as basically a synonym for what you're looking at. But you can also pay attention, covert attention, to something from the corner of your eyes. Well, you know that, right? You've, you've heard that in other lectures, but I will reiterate that. Um, we'll talk about the premotor theory of attention, which basically postulates that attention is a form of eye movement preparation. And I will discuss three lines of evidence in favor of this theory. Um, the idea being, I would, like, I would like you to have some idea of the kind of research that people have been doing, the kind of behavioral research and eye movement research and neurophysiological research to support these theories such as the premotor theory of attention. Um, so what about the exam? Um, the exam is a little bit open right now because I'm not sure how you're going to be quizzed at the end. Uh, maybe, maybe it will be delayed and in an, in an exam room. Maybe it, you, it will be an exam from home. We'll see. But in any case, um, what is important is that you do study the slides, right? So this, this presentation and the slides that we'll post, uh, post online. Focus on how, why, and when our eyes and our pupils move and on the relationship between attention and eye movement. So focus on cons things that are conceptually important. Um, don't focus on technical terms and anatomical details, right? So, um, in the, for example, the chapter that is the reading, the introductory chapter that is the reading for this, this, uh, this, this presentation, don't focus on all the nitty gritty details about how the superior colliculus is, is collected, connected to this and this, right? Just focus on sort of having a, a good grasp of why our eyes move as they do, how that is related to, to attention and what kind of experiments have been done to, uh, to, to, to answer those, uh, to, to test the theory of the, the premotor theory of attention. Okay, so here, um, let's start with the, with the basics of eye movements. Here actually you see um, a recording of my own eyes, slowed down by a factor two, and here I'm making saccadic eye movements, so these very rapid shifts of the eyes. Okay, there we go. Ah, sometimes my uh, presentation software has a little bit of trouble skipping the videos but okay um one word about head movements i always think it's interesting to put eye movements or other kinds of behavior that humans have in a broader context and see how that relates to um w what other animals do so small animals very often use head movements in the same way that eye mo humans use eye movements um, so i will talk about eye movements in in this in this lecture but in many cases the uh, small animals do the same by moving their entire head. Now, why do some animals move their head and others their eyes? That is basically a question of the size of the animal. Because if you, if you, if in, if you have a very large head like we do, or like a whale does, um, then moving your head is, is quite effortful. It consumes energy. It's quite a slow. Whereas if you are a sparrow, for example, um, or if you are a praying mantis, then you have a very tiny head and you can move it really easily. So you don't really need to move your eyes so much, right? So in a sense, um, the reason that our eyes can rotate is a way to conserve energy, you might say, right? It's faster to mo move just our little eyeball than it is to move our entire head. Um, here you actually see, this is kind of cool, I think. This is a video that I recorded when I was in Marseille. I lived in, in Marseille for a while. This is a praying mantis. And if you can see the video well, maybe you can't actually, you will see that this praying mantis is making a lot of very visual eye movements. You can see it now. 
yeah, you can see it rotate its head and really inspect. So what I'm doing is I'm kind of poking it with a twig to trigger sort of attacking behavior of the of the praying mantis. And then you see in response, it starts to, it is very, they're very strong actually, it's very creepy. Um, and, it, and you can see that it's a very visual animal, right? It's an insect, praying mantis is an insect, but it's a very visual animal. It's an interesting, uh, interesting uh, example of head movements in a uh, in an insect. All right. So now the big question is why do we move our eyes? If I ask this question in a lecture, and I usually do that, then the typical answer is we move our eyes because uh, uh, because we want to look at things, right? We we move our eyes to look at stuff, and of course we do look at stuff, and we do move our eyes to look at stuff, but the more fundamental reason that we use move our eyes is to stabilize the projection of the world onto our retina. And there are many animals that make eye movements only for that purpose and who don't really make eye movements to look at stuff. So let's introduce a few co key concepts. The first concept is the fovea versus the periphery. That's an important concept when you think about eye movements. So um, the human retina, and this is not true for all animals, but it is true for humans, is very... Uh, non-homogeneous. So we see only a very small part of the world in color and in detail, and that is the part of the world that falls onto our fovea. So we have a little dense, yeah, bit, foveal bit on our retina, right? A photosensitive layer with photoreceptors that are in the back of our eyes. Um, and this very small part, the fovea, that's where all our cone photoreceptors are, and that's what allows us to see in high visual acuity, so sharp with a lot of detail, and in color. Fo that's foveal or central vision. It is it is a bit fuzzy. There's no very clearly defined fovea. It's it's gradual, like most biological things. But if you want to give it a size, you would give it a size approximately of the size of your thumb if you keep it uh, at an arm's length. That's so. So it's about one visual degree. So yeah, so it's about the size of a thumb at the arm's length. And in the fovea, there are almost only cone photoreceptors. So everything else that's not a fovea is processed by your peripheral vision. And there we have poor color vision. We, we Sometimes people say that we have no color vision in our periphery. That's actually not true. We do have some because there are also cones in our periphery. periphery. Uh, and cones, remember from sensation and perception in similar lecture, cones are the types of photoreceptors that give us color vision. Rods are the kind of photoreceptors that don't have color vision. Um, but there are fewer cones so in, in our periphery, so um, the, our color vision is poorer than it is in, in foveal vision. Now, you have low visual acuity in the periphery. Why is that? Well, that is essentially because the photoreceptors in our peripheral vision, there are lots of them, but they, they sort of group together in networks where you, you sort of lose information, if you see what I mean. So whereas in our fovea, we have a lot of cones and they're quite small and every cone is processed individually, giving a lot of visual acuity, a lot of sharpness. But in our peripheral vision, um, there are mostly uh, rods. And the rods are bigger and spaced far, further apart to begin with. And they also sort of multiple rods converge on a single retinal ganglion cell. So a single cell that then sort of groups together information from multiple rods and then transfers it to the brain. And because of that grouping together, you lose spatial information and you have low acuity. Um, but because for other reasons that I won't go into, um, the, the peripheral vision is very sensitive to motion. It is poor in seeing many things, but it is very good at seeing motion. And that makes a lot of sense, right? If you think of it from an ecological perspective, because what happens is as soon as you detect motion in your peripheral vision, you will rotate your eyes and your head and your body in that direction. You will bring it in foveal vision and then you start to process the details, right? That's kind of the feedback loop. So it is kind of the peripheral vision is what captures your attention. And then your foveal vision is what does the actual discrimination. So, and as I said, uh, uh, peripheral vision is mediated by rods and cones, a mix of rods and cones. All right, um, another important concept is that of the retinal image. What does that mean? So here we have an example where a uh, kitty, you're looking at a kitty. Can I see my mouse? Yes, you're looking at a kitty here. And the light from the kitty falls onto the lens of your eye. This is lens. This would be the cornea, right? This would be the lens. And then from the lens, that, inf that light is projected uh, onto, the back of the, onto the back of the eye, and that's where the retina is, and that's where the photoreceptors are. Now, 
light from the world, in other words, falls through the lens of the eye onto the retina. Uh, and the retina, of course, sends visual input to the brain, or rather, in a sense, it is part of the brain, actually. So, um, well, depending on how you want to define a brain, of course. The retinal image, so the, the thing that's in the back, right, the, the projection of light onto the back layer of the eye, that is the projection of the world onto the retina. So when I talk about the retinal image, that's what I mean. And the concept of a retinal image is important if you want to understand why we move our eyes. So the idea is that the retinal image changes when our eyes move. And that's what you see in this video here. Um, so on the right hand side, you see an image of a bee. And the little circle indicates where someone is looking. So there are simulated eye movements. And then on the left hand side, you see a representation of the retinal image. It's not an accurate representation in any way, but it gives you some in, in every way, but it gives you some idea. So what should you note about this representation? Well, you should note that um, it shifts every time that the eyes move. Every time that the eyes move, this projection of the world onto the retina moves, shifts completely. And that causes a lot of disturbances in visual input. Another thing that you see is that you only actually see a, a small part of the world. So basically foveal vision, I've rendered here as being this sort of this, this circular window that you see and everything else would be peripheral vision. Obviously peripheral vision is not absent, right? So it would be more accurate to render this as a as sort of a blurry, semi-colorless uh, image, but I rendered it like this because it's easier. But you get the, you get the general idea. So... Now that, now that we've introduced the concept of foveal and peripheral vision and that of a retinal image, let's take a look at gaze stabilization reflexes. So um, imagine that you're in a moving train and uh, you're tracking the landscape from within that moving train. Then your eyes very smoothly sort of track the landscape like that, they follow, and then they snap back. And this gives a kind of sawtooth-like velocity profile, where you go whoop, back, whoop, back, whoop, back. That's also what you see in this video on the right-hand side. And this movement is called optokinetic nystagmus, OKN. And it's a gaze stabilization reflex, and it's really a reflex because you, it's impossible not to do that. You cannot suppress that. What does it do, this kind of, uh, what does optokinetic nystagmus do? Well, it is a way for a visual system to keep the retinal image stable for, as, for most of the time. So the, the say that you're, the, the landscape is moving in front of you and then your eyes kind of follow it. And while you are small, slowly following the, the, the landscape, you can imagine that the retinal image, so the way that the landscape projects onto your retina, stays more or less constant. It doesn't move that much. And that's good because it allows you to see things better. And then at some point, you're, of course, your eyes have rotated as far as they can. And then you kind of snap back. Now, while the eyes are snapping back, it's called the fast phase of the optokinetic nystagmus. The slow phase is the slow moving and the fast phase is the snapping back. While the eyes snap back, there is of course a lot of movement, a lot of disturbance of the retinal image. But it's fairly brief, right? So the, the visual system has adopted this strategy where for the most of the time during the slow phase, it's kind of stable. And then there's a sacrifice during the fast phase where whoop, everything sort of is disturbed, but then it's slow again. And then that's it. You get, so you get the idea, right? So the optokinetic nystagmus is a way to keep the retinal image stable for as long as possible. Another variation of that, uh, of that, uh, that reflex is the vestibular ocular reflex. There should have been a video here, which is not, uh, not rendered, but um, <clears throat> I can show you actually, because this is a video. Um, so what, what happens? If, you're, uh, if you look at someone, so I look at the camera and I rotate my head like this or like this, then you will see that I can. it's very easy for me to keep my eyes focused on the camera, right? And what happens then is that my eyes sort of smoothly rotate in the opposite direction from the where, 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 my eye, where my head rotates. So if my head rotates like this, my, eye to my eyes will rotate like that. They will counter the movement. Um, this is called the vestibular ocular reflex, and it is related to the optokinetic nystagmus that I just showed you, but it is different. It is also keeps the retinal image stable, right? It allows me to keep fixating on something. It is different from the optokinetic nystagmus in the source that drives the reflex. So optokinetic nystagmus is a visual response. You sit in a train, the landscape passes in front of you, and that visual input, that visual movement, triggers optokinetic nystagmus. 
vestibular ocular reflex, what we're talking about now, is driven by the vestibular system. So I rotate my head and then the vestibular system, right, your sense of balance, sends a signal to my visual system that my head is rotating and my, my visual system responds by that by ro counter-rotating my eyes. So it is there, are, there are two related reflexes and they often happen together, of course, but they are driven by a different modality. Visual for the optokinetic nystagmus and the vestibular ocular reflex is driven by uh, balance, your sense of balance. Um, oh, this is an interesting one. Yeah. So it, it, look, look at the video. So, and then, yeah, I will, can I play it again? Yeah, let me play it again. Look at the video. So um, there's something very subtle happening to the eyes of the sheep. So the sheep has um, vertical, uh, sorry, horizontally slit pupils, right? Our pupils are round, uh, but most animals have pupils that are either horizontally slit or vertically slit. And that's correlated with whether they're animals of prey or, uh, or, or hunters. So for example, a cat has vertical animals because it's, uh, it's a hunter and a sheep is generally eaten. <laughs> Uh, so it is, has, has horizontal pupils, and that has a pretty um, interesting reason why they have evolved like that, uh, which I find difficult to re repeat right now. It's a, it's a complicated argument, but the correlation is very, very strong. Horizontal pupils, animals that get eaten. Uh, vertical pupils, animals that eat. And circular pupils are mostly animals that are somewhat in between, between and that look ahead of them, uh, that have eyes in front of that. In any case, animals that have lateral eyes, so eyes on the side of the head, like sheep, and they have horizontal pupils, they have a very interesting type of gaze stabilization reflex that allows their pupil to always stay parallel with the ground. So you see here in this image, right, the still, that the pupil is parallel to the ground. Now let me show you the video again for the third time, because it's so cool. You will see that if, if it lifts its head, he or she lifts his or her head, um, that, that, that the, the head rotates like that, but the eyes, the pupil stays like this all the time. So there is, oh, yeah. Um, and this is a, an eye movement that is called a torsional eye movement that for humans would correspond to the eyes rotating like this, right? For sheep, it corresponds to rotating like this. For us, us would correspond to kind of like rotating like this. Um, Torsional eye movements. Humans don't do that so much. Uh, our eyes do rotate a little bit like this sometimes, but very little. And our reason, the reason for that is that for us there is no purpose, right? We don't really do make that kind of head movement where our eyes need to stay level with uh, with uh, with uh, with the horizon, so to say. But but sheep do, and uh, and and they have this particular type of eye movement. It's very interesting, and it's a gaze stabilization reflex because just like the previous ones, it helps to sort of minimize the amount of motion sta uh, movement in the retinal image by keeping their eyes sort of at the same uh, same position to the ground. Um, then there is a uh, oh here I actually have the vestibular ocular reflex. The wrong video, sorry. Poor preparation. Poor preparation. Um, so forget about the video. What I want to show you is a type of eye, movements that eye movement that happens when you shift your gaze from far to near. So I will show it now in the camera. Um, what happens is that if now I look very far away, and now if, my, if I look at something that is nearby, you will see that a lot of things happen. But one of the things that happens is that my eyes will rotate inwards. So I become a little bit cross-eyed. This is virgins. That's a virgins eye movement. Um, why does that happen? Again, it's a gaze stabilization reflex because it allows you to um, to keep your focus on a single object. Um, regardless, so it allows you to basically keep one object in foveal vision for both eyes, right? And to keep them in foveal vision for both eyes, if something is nearby, you kind of need to rotate both eyes so that they point in the same direction, so to say. And that that is that is the virgin's eye movement. In the virgin's is part of the so-called near triad, a combination of three kinds of eye movements. Virgins, a proper eye movement that rotates the eyes. Um, lens accommodation. So if you look at something nearby, your lens, the lens in the eye becomes more curved so that you focus on something that's nearby. And finally, pupil constriction, the pupil near response. Your pupil becomes smaller if you look at something that is nearby. These things together are called the near triad. Virgins, accommodation, 
and pupil constriction. Um, so it keeps helps to keep both eyes pointed at the same object. And again, the video that I just showed here, I misplaced it. That was actually the vestibular ocular reflex video. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so gaze stabilization is the oldest function of eye movements. Uh, it occurs in most sighted animals. Um, so, but even fish, right? If you have, if you put fish in a tank and you have some kind of movement in the tank, for example, a texture that moves, they will show an optokinetic nystagmus. They will show vestibular ocular reflex. They don't, ref most fish have the, high, uh, the eyes on the, on the side, so they don't really show virgins um, because they, the eyes don't look at the same thing. But, uh, but they show gaze stabilization reflexes. Insects show gaze stabilization reflexes. Um, so that is, in a sense, why eye movements have evolved, to keep the retinal image stable. Um, so why is it important, actually, to keep the retinal image stable? There, there are a few reasons. First is that photoreceptors in the eyes are slow. So if, you, if, you don't, if you're in a train and you look at the landscape and you're not tracking the landscape with your eyes, then the landscape will move really, really quickly. And it will move so quickly that the time, basically, the moment that the time that it takes for you to stimulate a photoreceptor, that the photoreceptor starts firing, is too long for you to actually, for the photoreceptor to be stimulated, right? Um, I said it a little bit unclearly, I think. So what I mean is, say that you're tracking a light, a single light, and then if that light moves really, really rapidly across the retina, then every individual photoreceptor will be stimulated by that light only very briefly. Um, and you will not see it because the stimulation time might be too brief. Whereas if you track the light with your eyes, then you sort of stabilize it on your retina. And there is a single set of photoreceptors that's actually stimulated by that light for quite a long time. And then you can see it really well. And that is one uh, very trivial and obvious reason why gaze stabilization is important. Another ret uh, So retinal image motion causes blurry vision. Another reason is more about a visual processing. It's that gaze stabilization allows you to detect distinguish movement out there from movement that you uh, do yourself. So if I, um, if I would shake my head and I would not have the vestibular ocular reflex, then the whole world would move on my retina. It would be a complete mess. Now, if then there's also something else move, actually moving out there, right? For example, an, a prey animal, an, an animal or a predator, um, um, it would be difficult to detect it. It would be difficult to distinguish the movement of the predator from the movement that I generate myself. Now, but that doesn't happen. I have the vestibular ocular reflex that allows me to keep my eyes stable. And because of that, the world is very stable on my retina. And then if there's a predator moving, it's very easy to, for me to distinguish that predator, to detect that predator. So that it's easy detection of movement out there. Okay. Um, yeah, so if the retinal image is stable, then all movement on the retina corresponds to movement out there in the world. That's the logic. Okay. Now, let's then move on to smooth pursuit, a different type of eye movement. So now we've, we've covered the gaze stabilization reflexes. Let's now move on to uh, smooth pursuit. Here I'm doing smooth pursuit. So um, you see that smooth pursuit is characterized by sort of a smooth rotation of the retina, or of the eye, sorry. And then you think, oh, that's quite similar actually to the vestibular ocular reflex and the optokinetic nystagmus. And it is, in a sense. It is the, the sort of the, the type of eye movement is very similar. But smooth, we call something smooth pursuit if it has a goal. Let's first make the link actually to optokinetic nystagmus a bit clearer. So, um, oh, so yes. Yeah. So if you look out, right, we had this optokinetic nystagmus, you, you look out a moving train, you smoothly track this landscape, that's the slow phase, and then you snap back, that's the fast phase. Now, smooth pursuit is like the slow phase of optokinetic nystagmus. It really looks like it too. Um, but it is different from nystag nystagmus, sorry, in the sense that it has a voluntarily attended target. So optokinetic nystagmus is triggered reflexively by movement, in by sort of a movement, moving world in front of you. Um, smooth pursuit happens when you say, okay, I want to track this. I see a bird in the sky. I focus on it. I track the movement of that bird in the sky. I have selected with my attention that bird and now I'm tracking it. And that's smooth pursuit. Now I'm sort of, I can decide to move my finger like this, or I can decide not to do it. And I can decide to do it and not to do it. I can control smooth pursuit voluntarily to 
a certain degree. And that's what makes it not a reflex, not purely a reflex. Um, and that's what character is characteristic of smooth pursuit. Only a few kinds of animals actually can do that. Um, it's interesting that, and we can, we are very good at doing smooth pursuit. It's interesting that eye movements have sort of a hierarchy. There are, as I said, the gaze stabilization reflexes are basically done by all animals uh, that have eyes, obviously. Uh, and then on top of that, you know, some, some animals show saccadic like eye movements that I will talk about later. And then actually only some, some animals, like we, also show, show, show smooth pursuit. Um, they're, as though there are different, yeah, sort of a, an evolutionary progression, you might say, almost. Um, but we show smooth pursuit. All right. What is interesting about smooth pursuit is that it anticipates expected movement. So it is not purely a reflexive tracking of, um, of something that moves. But there is an element of anticipation. And this is true of eye movements in general. Now, what you're seeing here in this figure are the graphs from a paper by Eileen Gowler, one of the main researchers on, uh, on, on smooth pursuit. And on the left, so I'll walk you through what the graphs actually really show. Um, on, the, on, the, on the left, you have the, uh, the speed of the eye movement. And on the right, you have the moment that a, a target starts moving. And participants are instructed to follow that moving target with their eyes. And you see that basically that they, they do that, right? The target starts moving at time zero. If it moves in one direction, they follow it. So they, this is not their position, right? They're, they, this is the velocity. So it takes some time for them to reach the velocity, the tracking velocity, about 200 milliseconds, and then they keep tracking it. And if it's in the other direction, they do the same thing. Um, so here you see, well, speed up and then track, track, track. That's what you're seeing. This is without the anticipation. So for example, in a situation where there is a dot in the center and it can move to the left or it can move to the right, but you don't know. So you cannot anticipate. Here on the right, there is a voice that is saying in which direction the thing is going to move. So you're looking at the dot and then a voice says to the right, and then you know that in one second later, it will go up. And then what you see is that actually the eyes start to anticipate. So there's already some velocity building up in the movement direction up. Uh, before the eyes actually, before the dot actually starts moving, and that's where you that's where you can tell the prediction and anticipation is actually a very important aspect of eye movements and uh, and smooth pursuit. Um, okay, let's move on to saccadic eye movement, rapid uh, rapid gaze shifts. So now we've covered smooth pursuit. Let's move on to saccades. Um, ah, here I am again, the same video of me making scatic eye movements. Uh, so again, let's link this back to the optokinetic nystagmus, right? So there's this smooth tracking, snapping back. And saccades are like this snapping back. They're kind of like the fast phase of the, of the optokinetic nystagmus. But then again, with a voluntarily attended target. So saccadic eye movements relate to the fast phase of the optokinetic nystagmus in more or less the same way that smooth pursuit relates to the slow phase of the optokinetic nystagmus. Um, and again, only some animals such as we actually make these kinds of voluntary saccadic eye movements. It's a funny story actually about, um, I, I was at a conference was a few years ago where someone um, had done, it was a, had done, it was in a, a British guy. They had done eye tracking with horses. They had been funded, I think, by, by some kind of, I don't know, organization having to do with horses. Um, because they wanted to know what horses uh, pay attention to and stuff. But, so they developed an eye tracker for horses, which was a lot of work. And then they found out that horses don't really look at anything. So they just they just show these gaze stabilization reflexes. But other than that, they, they might very occasionally make an eye movement, but hardly ever. Uh, that is not so surprising, actually, because the reason that we make saccadic eye movements is largely, and smooth pursuit, is largely because we have this fovea and we want to orient our fovea at something. Animals that don't really have a fovea, like a horse, like most animals, like a bunny, for example, they, they don't really have any reason to make saccadic eye movements. So if you, if, you, if you look at the eyes of a bunny, you will see that they're very, they show gaze stabilization reflexes, but if they're sitting still, they're not kind of like looking around much. Every once in a while, their eyes will go up, and then it will stay, like for a minute, it will stay the same. And whoop, maybe, no, not a minute, but they, they very rarely make eye movements. And that is because they don't have a fovea actually to use to look at. So they, uh, they don't have a fovea to look at things. So they just kind of, uh, 
um, how should I say that? Um, they just kind of like sit there and, and take in the information. So saccadic eye movements are our primary mechanism for scanning the environment. And they're really fast, so our gaze jumps almost instantaneously. So here actually at the bottom you see some data from one of my own papers. And you see that here this is, this, every line is, a, is, is an individual eye movement. And you see that there is some variation. So the uh, eye position is plotted here. You see there's some variation and the x-axis shows time. Unfortunately, I cut off the label. But this is approximately the time that the eyes are in motion is about 60 milliseconds, something like that. So from 40 to 60 milliseconds, depending on how big the eye movement is. And in that very short period of time, the eyes speed up to an enormous velocity that would in theory allow you to track sort of an airplane moving very closely in front of you. Um, at, at top speed. Um, so, and, and then they slow down again. And it can be so fast because our eyes are quite light, so they, they can rotate easily. Um, and they're very short. And we're very frequent. So we make about three saccadic eye movements per second. So our eyes go tick, 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 tick. It varies, of course, of the situation. Right now, right now, I'm looking at the camera, and my eyes, I don't really make that many saccadic eye movements. But in a different kind of situation, I would make a lot. Okay, so now we've covered the basics of attention and eye movements. Um, uh, no, mostly eye movements actually. And let's now move on to attention and eye movements and especially the premotor theory of attention. So I hope now that I've given you some background and some understanding of the basics, sort of physiology, well, or the basics, uh, basic movements that we have, our movement repertoire that we have with our eyes. Gaze stabilization reflexes, optokinetic nystagmus, vestibular ocular reflex, virgins, Torsional eye movements, um, those are the gaze stabilization reflexes. Then we have smooth pursuit, tracking something with your eyes, and saccadic eye movements. And now we're going to mostly focus on saccadic eye movements and see how they are related to attention, because that's a very hot topic of research within cognitive psychology. Um, so over the tension, th this picture is for no reason other than that I think it's a cute picture. Um, over detention is directly looking at something. So if, if I call something, I direct my over detention to something, it's I look at it. Covert detention is paying attention from the corner of your eye. So right now, say that I'm looking here up, at my finger, but I'm paying attention to the camera, that will be covert detention. Um, when, when psychologists talk about attention, they virtually always mean covert detention. So attention and eye movements often coincide. Right? So very often um, you look at what you pay attention to. And that makes a lot of sense because as I explained before, basically our fovea, fovea is made to look at things and to take in information. So it makes a lot of sense to look at the thing that you attend to. But you don't necessarily have to. You can dissociate over and covert attention. And one example of, po over of doing that is the Posner queuing paradigm. And I know that you saw that in, uh, in Sarah Fabry's lecture, so I'm not going into that. But the, the Posner's queuing paradigm is the, one of the most famous ways to study covert visual attention. Now, so here was a question that I was going to ask you during the lecture. Can you think of a real life situation in which attention and eye movements are dissociated? So now you're thinking very hard. And then the answer that you're going to come up with is, hey, conversation. So um, conversation is very interesting. Because it is one of the few cases in which attention and eye movements are dissociated, in which we really use our covert attention um, in real life. So what is the, and pay attention to this next time that you're, you're, you're talking to someone, having a conversation. So the, the, the typical way in which conversations go is uh, the speaker um, is, is, has gaze averted. So what I'm doing now is actually sort of looking at you through the camera while I'm talking. It's very atypical. If we would be talking in person, my eyes would be averted like this. And you, as a listener, you would look at me. Then um, when I'm done speaking, I would shift my eyes back to you. And that would be my signal. Okay, now it's your turn. Um, so when, when the speaker is done, sort of you look and then it's kind of a signaling system. It's your turn now. And then you would start speaking and you would avert your gaze. And when you're done, you would point your gaze at me and et cetera, et cetera. And uh, here you see a result from a, a paper uh, that shows this. 
And of course, in real life, things are always messy, right? This handoff system with sort of signaling, now it's your turn, is kind of messy. It's just an, an, on a sort of behavior on average. But you will see it if you if you look closely at this figure. You will see it because... Um, uh, so here we have two people, person A and person B. And you see that when person B is talking here, describe the, the, the sort of pinkish uh, color, then person A is gazing. And gazing means that person A is looking at person B. And then you see what when person B is done describing... You see that then person B suddenly starts gazing, right? So that's the handoff system. Uh, and you will see that um, imperfectly, right? So people make exceptions to this general rule all the time, but you will see that imperfect, you will see that to some extent often in conversations. And when people don't do that, when people don't act, well, for example, when someone talks to you and looks you in the eye, that's pretty intense. That is either very flirtatious or kind of inappropriate. Um, don't do that. But generally speaking, so now I've given you an example of a dissociation between attention and eye movements. But generally speaking, we look at what we attend to. And this kind of social consensus during conversation is an exception to that rule. Now, in the premotor theory of attention um, is a way, I think, a very powerful way to explain covert attention. So according to the premotor theory of attention, covert attention is a byproduct of preparing an eye movement without executing it. So the idea of the premotor theory of attention is that if I'm if I'm looking here and I'm paying attention to the camera, that what I'm really doing is really preparing to make an eye movement there. And then I can withhold it and sort of for a long time pay covert attention, but it's very effortful. It's an unusual thing to do. Um, but that's what it is. Covertly attending to something is preparing to look at it, but you actually don't look at it. You inhibit the eye movement. Um, and another prediction or yeah, another uh, part of the premotor theory of attention is that every eye movement is preceded by a covert shift of attention, a pre-schematic shift of attention. So basically, if I'm, if, I'm, uh, if I'm looking here and I shift my eyes to the camera, then about 200 milliseconds before my eyes actually set in motion, I already shift my covert attention. So there's like the spotlight of attention precedes your eyes. That's kind of the idea. Um, and to an approximation, this is actually true, and we can show that in a lot of experiments. So let me walk you through a few experiments which I personally find very elegant and revealing. Uh, so let's consider a classic study by Heiner Doibel and Werner Schneider, two very uh, very good cognitive psychologists, uh, one from Munich and one from Bielefeld in, in Germany. Um, and it's, it's an old study, and the paradigm is kind of quirky, but I'll walk you through it so that you kind of understand. So we, they showed, had participants initially fixate in his fixation cross in the center of a display. And then on the left and on the right, there were placeholders, sort of these figure eight things. And there were ovals among, uh, 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 around the, the central three placeholders. And these had different colors. Um, so then, why did they do that? Well, because then next there would be a cue, sort of an arrow pointing to the right or the left, and that arrow would, uh, would also have a color, and that would indicate what you had to look at. So if it was green and pointing to the right, you had to look at this green oval in the middle. And if it was blue, you would have to look here, right? You get the idea. And of course, you could also look at the left. Now, and then, when that cue disappeared, 80 seconds afterwards, so when the cue disappeared, right? The, the, so the arrow appeared here. And then when it disappeared, that told the participants, okay, now move, right? So it was not move as soon as you see the cue, but the cue tells you what, where to go. Then you remove it and then move. And then 80 seconds after they're supposed to move their eyes, but they haven't yet, because it takes a while to set your eyes in motion, right? So it takes about say 250 second, milliseconds to move your eyes. So if you 80 milliseconds after a go cue, movement cue, presents something, then you're about to make an eye movement, but you haven't yet. And that's the crucial thing. So, and then for 120 milliseconds, they presented a target. And the target was always on the side where they had to make an eye movement. So in this case, on the right. Um, but it was not always at the location that they had to make an eye movement to. So in this case, in this case, you see they had to make an eye movement to the green oval. Here, this one. But the target, which was an E, either an E or an inverted E, and they had to say which one it was, is actually here in the blue circle, blue oval. And sometimes it will be in the green one and sometimes also in the center one. But there was no correlation, right? There were two independent tasks. And then after the eye movement, participants had to say whether they saw an E or an inverted E. And why this completely 
complicated paradigm. So first of all, let me just, if you are wondering, if you're interested in methods, why do they actually have only three locations for the targets and they have five placeholders? Well, that is because they want to make sure that also the, the sort of the, this one and this one, the ones on the side, have flankers too. So they have stuff next to it too, because otherwise they would be really easy for the detection task. So that's why they have these sort of use, useless flankers as the first and uh, the fifth stimulus. Um, yeah, okay. So, and then what they're interested in is the basically a congruency effect. If people, if the target, the E or the inverted E, happens to be at the location where you're also making an eye movement to, are you then better at detecting it? That was the question. And the answer, of course, as you preview, is yes. So what you're seeing here on the right is the, the figure from their, uh, from their paper. So we have the accuracy of that detection task, saying whether it was an E or an inverted E. Um, the position where it appeared. So and so here, this is the position where the discrimination target appeared. And here, these different lines are where the saccade target was, so where they had to make an eye movement to. So if you had to make an eye movement towards the first one, so that's the circle, you see that you're much better when the discrimination target is also, the E was also at the first one. If you had to make a second eye movement to the second one, you're much better if the, the discrimination target is also there. And if you had to make an eye movement to the third one, you're much better if the discrimination target is also there. So you see a very strong interaction between the location of the discrimination target and the location of the saccade target on um, percentage correct. In other words, that's a bit technical, but I hope you'll be able to follow. Um, just before a saccadic eye movement, discrimination performance was best when the discrimination target was at the same location as the saccade target. And what does that show? Well, it shows that the tension automatically shifts towards the saccade target. So this is how it goes. You make an eye movement, you prepare an eye movement. Just before your eye movement, your attention sort of goes already to that location. And then if a target, a detection target appears there, you're actually better at seeing it. And that is what Heiner and Doibel in this pretty complicated but pretty elegant paradigm showed. Um, and it's a very reliable effect. It's been replicated over and over. So right before the eye set in motion, attention already shifts. The pre saccadic shift of attention. Uh, okay, so I hope I've given you some flavor now of how what this kind of research looks like. Um, I think just to give you some feedback on what you should know for the exam, you don't have to rep be able to reconstruct this entire experiment in all its details, but I feel you should have some grasp of the conceptual logic of these kinds of experiments and what comes out and what they're testing. Right, so be able to be able to think clearly about this experiment. If 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 um, if you don't really feel right now that you really understood it, go back and watch it again, because you should fully understand how this Doibel and Schneider paradigm works. Um, even though you don't need to reproduce it in all of its detail, but you should be able to sort of come up with a paradigm, say to, so to say, that basically tests this in a way, in a slightly different way. Right? Reasonable people can make slightly different experiments, but you should understand the general logic. Okay, let's move on to um, another phenomenon. I think this is again very interesting. I hope actually you find this interesting. I find it really interesting. I, I, I know it's a bit niche, it's a bit nerdy, but I find it really interesting. Um, saccadic curvature. And this is a study actually from the PhD. This is a figure from the PhD thesis of Stefan van der Stichel, who is now a professor in Utrecht, a friend and colleague of mine, and who also wrote two very interesting books, popular science books about attention. This is how attention works and concentration. Look it up. So werkt aandacht in Dutch and concentratie in Dutch. Um, um, so, and he did a lot of research on saccadic curvature. Now, what is that saccadic curvature? So if... So far, I've talked about saccadic eye movements as though they're jumps, like tick tuck. Right? But of course, they're not jumps. They are uh, continuous movements from a, point A to B. And they are, the movement is never straight. So if you make an eye movement from, say, to the top, so here in this example that you see, you see participants make an eye movement from this cross to this thing at the top here, then you don't go directly from a from to the top, but you generally curve a little bit sort of to this direction or a little bit to that direction. There's curvature, saccadic curvature. Um, and there's a lot of information in that curvature. So stimuli that capture attention systematically cause curvature. So here in this example, there is this kind of this, this little diamond shape was flashed. It captures your attention. And what happens then? 
Sometimes the eyes curve towards it and sometimes they cur curve away from it. I will explain why. Um, sometimes away and sometimes towards. But it is not neutral. There are very systematic effects of things that capture your attention on curvature. So what causes the eyes to curve? What, no, let me rephrase. What determines whether you curve towards something or away from something? So curvature towards mostly occurs in two situations. And here you see the figure of a, a graph from uh, Walker and colleagues, a bit of an older paper. But what you're seeing here on the y-axis is the curve, the extent to which eyes curve towards something, a, st a stimulus or away from a stimulus. And on the x-axis, you see the latency of their, the, the saccadic eye movement. So on the left would be very fast eye movements and on the right would be very slow eye movements. So the paradigm would be, you have to make an eye movement up, say, and at the same time that, that you, you're instructed to make that eye movement, the stimulus appears and your eyes are either cur curved towards that stimulus or away from it. That's what's shown on the y-axis. And on the x-axis is the time it actually takes you to make that eye movement. And then there are two lines, unpredictable and predictable. And that indicates whether participants can predict in advance where that distracting stimulus is going to appear. Okay. I hope you're with me. Then what you're seeing here is that overall there is a negative slope. Right? So you see that the slower the eye movements are, the, uh, the, the more you start to curve away from that stimulus. On top of that, you see that the predictability also makes a difference. So if a stimulus is unpredictable, you tend to curve towards it. Whereas a stimulus is predictable, you tend to curve away from it. A different way to think about it is that it's like that predictable stimulus stimuli have sort of already a head start. So what does this mean? Uh, for fast saccades and for unpredictable distractors, you mostly curve towards the stimulus. What does this suggest? It suggests that unpredictable stimuli capture your attention. Um, and then when they capture your attention, it's the same because of the uh, premotor theory of, eye, of premotor theory of attention. They capture your attention, so that means that there's an eye movement prepared towards them. And while that happens, you sort of cur your eyes curve towards that stimulus. Um, after a little while, you sort of inhibit that prepared eye movement, and then that curvature to way, uh, uh, towards changes in curvature away, if you see what I mean. So initially there's an, a distractor appears, initially an, an eye movement program towards that distractor is prepared. Then after a while that's inhibited because you shouldn't make an eye movement there. And then the eyes start to curve away. Um, and for predictable stimuli, more or less the same thing happens. The only difference is that if something is predictable, you can already sort of start to suppress it to begin with. So when you know that something is going to appear at a certain location, you already have some kind of inhibitory tag, if you will, at that location, and your eyes already curve away from it very quickly. So it takes less time to inhibit it. But that's the general idea. And you see how this is very strong support for the premotor theory of attention, right? Um, because it really shows that there is this eye movement preparation to the distractor, uh, and it actually affects the trajectory of the eye movement in this very short span, right? Because remember, an eye movement, a scatic eye movement, takes like 60 milliseconds. So within that 60 milliseconds, there is curvature towards or away from it, and it actually shows the sort of the extent to which you also have other eye movement uh, programs prepared at that moment. Very cool stuff, very cool stuff. All right, um, let's then take a look at neurophysiology. Um, so what is neurophysiology? It's measuring stuff in the brain, right? And the main area, and when it comes to scatic eye movements, or the main study, the area that is mostly studied, is the frontal eye fields. It's only that is what it's called in the macaques, actually, because all pretty much all eye movement research, um, neuro invasive eye movement research, has been done with macaques. Some with humans, but mostly with macaques. Um, no, actually, rewind. No, no invasive eye movement stuff has been done with humans. Eye movement stuff, yes. Invasive, no. Only invasive stuff has been done with macaques, and there that area is called the frontal eye field. Now. What is interesting about the frontal eye fields of the macaque? Say that you insert an electrode into the macaque brain, into the frontal eye fields, it's around here, um, and you st electrically stimulate it, then you trigger a saccade. Um, and that, look, that saccade is to a predictable location. So you have one electrode, you stimulate it, the eyes will go, say, a little bit to the top right, and then you stimulate it again, they will go to the top right, 
to the top right, to the top right, always to the same location. You, you, move, the, you move the electrode a little bit to a different neuron. It will, again, maybe now go to the bottom left, to the bottom left, to the bottom left, but to a predictable location. The point being that every sort of neuron, or, or every ensemble of neurons in the frontal eye field has a movement, has, has a motor field. And the, the part of the visual field that the cicada will be triggered to if you stimulate, if you stimulate those neurons. That's the motor field. Um, that's a property of the neurons in the frontal eye fields. And that's why they're called frontal eye fields, because they're involved in, in eye movement control. They're like the premotor cortex of eye movements, essentially. Um, different for different neurons. Now, and how do we link this now to attention? So um, you need to stimulate um, you need to stimulate these neurons quite a bit in order for an eye movement to be triggered. If you stimulate them only a little bit, then a shift of attention is triggered. So, and that shift of attention is always triggered to the neuron's motor field. So how does that work? So say that there is a set of neurons and you know that if you stimulate it quite a lot electrically, that an eye movement will be made to some kind of location that is here, so to say, right? Your fixation point is here and here's the motor field. Then if you do subthreshold stimulation, so you stimulate that neuron a little bit, but not enough to make, an, make to trigger a saccade, then you will see that the monkey starts to become better able to detect stuff that is presented in that movement field. So there is a shift of attention. And you see how this is very strong support for the premotor theory of attention again, right? Because it is, you're literally sort of preparing an eye movement in the monkey brain, and you see that this results in a shift of attention. So when, for, and what, so I'll walk you actually through the graph that I've plotted here. So here you see two monkeys, monkey A is black and monkey B is uh, striped or whatever, um, dotted. And um, they, they, they measure detection performance um, relative to some kind of baseline of stimuli that either presented inside the motor field of that monkey or outside the motor field. And then they see that when a stimulus is presented inside the motor field during sub-threshold stimulation of that, the frontal eye fields, the, th the threshold uh, decreases, so you become better, right? The decreased threshold for detecting something is better performance, whereas the stuff outside is kind of increased a little bit. So here you see that selective enhancement due to attention of stimuli that are presented within the motor field of a neuron during subthreshold stimulation. That's a very long sentence, but I hope you understand. What does it suggest? It suggests that frontal eye field stimulation, when it's too weak to trigger a saccade, that a saccade is still prepared to some extent, right? Because it's not an all or nothing thing. And that results in a shift of covert attention to the motor field of that neuron. And that is very strong support for the premotor theory of attention. All right, that's it. So uh, let's wrap up what we saw for the premotor theory of attention. The premotor theory of attention says that uh, covert attention is the same as preparing an eye movement without actually executing it. Then we saw Doyle and Schneider's behavioral study showing that just before you make an eye movement to a location, detection performance at that location is enhanced. That's what Doyle and Schneider showed. Then we looked at saccadic curvature. And you saw that things that capture attention initially cause the eyes to curve towards them because an, an eye movement program is prepared towards that stimulus. Then if that stimulus becomes inhibited, the curvature actually changes such that the eyes curve away from it. Scattered curvature, again support for the premotor theory of attention. Um, and finally, we saw that if you, if you trigger an eye movement by stimulating the frontal eye fields, then the, the eyes go to a predictable location. If you reduce the intensity of the stimulation, sub-threshold stimulation, you see that no eye movement is actually triggered, but a shift of attention is still triggered, suggesting that indeed the shift of attention is kind of like a, an eye movement being programmed, but not actually executed. So those are the three uh, sort of points, points of evidence that I wanted to highlight. Um, so let's wrap things up. So what can we conclude from today's lecture? Foveal, central vision. Um, is, is the part of the visual field that has high color, that gives you good color vision, has high visual acuity, but it's only a very small part of the visual field, corresponding approximately to your thumb at an arm's length. Peripheral vision is everything that's not central vision. It has poor color vision, but not, not, not zero. It has low visual acuity, and it is most of the visual field. And the function is kind of such that peripheral vision is what you use to detect something, and then you look at it, and then you use your foveal, vi foveal vision to actually sort of process it. The retinal image is the projection of the world onto the retina. 
And it changes when your eyes and your body or the environment move. Um, and that's why we have gaze stabilization reflexes to reduce these changes to the retinal image. So gaze stabilization reflexes keep the retinal image stable. That's one class of eye movements that we looked at. And remember, there was the optokinetic nystagmus, the vestibular ocular reflex, avergent eye movements, and torsional eye movements. Those were the four that I talked about. Smooth pursuit are the smooth eye movements that we use to smoothly track moving objects. And sciatic eye movements are these very rapid shifts of gaze that move the eyes from one object to the next. And I talked about how smooth pursuit is like the slow phase of optokinetic nystagmus, but then with the target. And saccades are like the fast phase of optokinetic nystagmus, but then with, uh, with the target. And then we talked about overt attention, which is a fancy way of saying that you directly look at something. And covert attention, which is paying attention to something from the corner of your eye. And the premotor theory of attention posits that covert attention is a byproduct of preparing an eye movement without actually executing it. Now, and here's an example question of kind of of the kind that you might get at the exam, or you're certainly not going to get this one. You get that, right? But something like that. Um, describe the premotor theory of attention and provide one line of evidence that supports this theory. You see how this is a conceptual question? And then I tend to give some kind of hint of what I would like to see in the answer. So a complete answer provides a concrete description of the theory, a concrete explanation of an experimental design that had been used, has been used to test the theory, a concrete explanation of the main results from this experiment and how these support the theory. So how might I answer this question correctly for to get all the points? I might say the premotor theory of attention holds that a shift, a covert attention is a byproduct of preparing an eye movement without actually executing it. That's perfect, right? Not too many words. It's exactly what that theory is. Provide one line of evidence. Um, let's take, let's take Doibel and Schneider. Um, Doibel and Schneider uh, conducted an experiment in which they had participants make an eye movement. And then just before the eye set in motion, they presented a detection target either at the, at the target of the eye movement of, or just next to it. That's their paradigm. Um, and then they found that detection of that this detection target was best when it was presented at the saccade target location compared to other locations just next to it. This supports the uh, premotor theory of attention because it shows that just before you make an eye movement, attention already shifts towards the location that you're going to make an eye movement to. That would be a perfect, uh, that would be a perfect uh, answer, I think. And of, co of course, you depending on whether, if it's going to be a pen and paper thing, you might draw some figures or whatever. If it's on the computer, you can't. But uh, be very concrete, as short as possible, but not shorter. And certainly don't try to sort of compensate for the incorrectness of your answer by writing a lot of ir ir irrelevant stuff, because it will not give you more points. Right? So I, I never give points just because you write like an essay of two pages that in principle contains some fragments of, of sentences that when arranged in some kind of order might compose a valid answer. I you get points for a valid answer and if it stands by itself. Okay, um, so some food for thought, which I always like to discuss at the end of the lecture, but now we can't, of course, but think about it. If we see only a small part of the world at any time, then why do we feel as if we see everything clearly and in color? That's a sort of a philosophical question, and I will leave you with that philosophical question uh, to, uh, to think about. All right. I hope you enjoyed the lecture, even though it was a bit unusual. And uh, at some point, <laughs> I guess I will see you in person.